I do like high growth companies, but I also like profitable companies. And sometimes this puts me in a bit of a dilemma because how do you value companies that do not produce any free cash flow, but are nonetheless growing their revenue incredibly quickly? Well, there is an alternative and Facebook trades at six times. Oatly as well as Netflix at 14 times, Apple and Ferrari are available for 16 times, we've got Unity at 32 times and Tesla is at 79 times. Now you may be wondering, times what? Well, this is the topic of today's video and I will introduce a metric that you can use to value free profit companies. So companies that are still growing rapidly and are reinvesting all or most of their profits back into the business to fuel that growth. And so without further ado, let's get started. All right, hey there, my name is Brian Zellman and as you might know, companies go through different stages of yeah, the business life cycle. Depending on which model you look at, there are usually around four to six stages. And one pretty straightforward model of business life cycles that I have internalized. Well, this model consists of five stages. The startup stage, the rapid growth stage, an expansion stage, maturity, and then the decline stage. And I would argue that depending on which stage a business is currently in, you might have to use or consider different valuation methods. The most well-known valuation method, for instance, is the PE ratio, short for price to earnings ratio. And I'm generally not a very big fan of this valuation method. And the PE ratio is most certainly absolutely useless when it comes to valuing businesses that are still in one of the first two stages. And even companies in the expansion stage might still reinvest a large portion of their profits back into the business to fuel future growth. And obviously businesses that are reinvesting most of their earnings, for example, via research and development to yeah, develop new products or to improve already existing products or via marketing expenditures to reach new customers or increase yeah, consumers brand awareness. Well, these businesses will have depressed earnings, of course. Now you might be wondering why this is important. Well, if we just consider Netflix, for example, next Netflix was the best performing stock of the last decade. Since 2012 alone, investors 36 x their money if they held onto the stock. However, if we look at the underlying financials, we can see that pretty much in all of those years, the company didn't produce any significant accounting profits. Back in 2013, for instance, net income was 17 million. Back then in February 2013, Netflix was worth around 10 billion US dollars. So effectively, the stock was rating at a PE ratio of more than 500. And of course, it didn't look cheap at all. But then again, the stock has delivered yeah, marvelous returns since then. So apparently, you need a different valuation method for businesses that are yeah, in an earlier stage of their business life cycle. And the hardcore value investor might just stop right here. That's most certainly what Warren Buffett would do. He would simply conclude that the investment idea is probably too hard for him. And that's what well, that approach is completely fine. In fact, one of my checklist items is to only invest in free cash flow, yeah, positive free cash flow generative businesses. But you might argue that, yeah, this approach is actually a little lazy because, of course, not every promising investment will show, yeah, superb profitability right away. And missing Netflix, yeah, around 10 years ago was definitely a costly mistake. So let me introduce another valuation method. Well, if we cannot rely on net income, which can be found at the yeah, absolute bottom of the income statement, this is why net income is called the bottom line, by the way. Well, we have to work our way up on the income statement. You first come across operating income, but companies that are investing heavily in growth will usually also see their operating income at depressed levels. So the next profitability line is cross profit. And that's the metric that we are going to work with today and that we will now take a closer look at. Cross profit margin is a measure of how much money a company has left over from every sale after taking out what it cost the business to produce the product or the service they sold. One advantage of looking at cross profits is that cross profits 
generally tend to be much more stable than other types of profits like free cash flow or net income, which yeah fluctuate much more widely, wildly, and which in turn makes it harder and more challenging for investors to determine the true earnings power of the underlying business. If we just consider cost course cross margin, for example, we can see that the firm's cross margin basically didn't fluctuate at all over the last 10 years. You could argue that such stable margins actually indicate the presence of a moat as the business seems to have great pricing power and also bargaining power over its suppliers. As you can imagine, some industries will have higher gross margins than others. According to data collected by the NYU Stern School of Business, the average gross margin in the auto and truck industry, for example, was as low as 14.25% while the average gross margin in the pharmaceutical industry was actually around 67%. Now with the help of all of this theory, we can now get to the most interesting part of this video. How can we use yeah, all of this theory to value unprofitable companies? Well, the investment research platform Ticker has actually recently introduced a new valuation multiple, enterprise value to gross profit. Enterprise value basically considers the market capitalization of a company, but also short-term and long-term debt, as well as any cash on the company's balance sheet. So looking at that valuation multiple is one option you could go with, but a simple valuation ratio doesn't really factor in growth. So I want to go one step further, and I also want to show you how you can estimate how much an operating profit a business might produce at maturity, maturity based on yeah, the firm's Cross profits. Because as investors, we want to figure out what kind of operating profit and free cash flow margin a company could post once it reaches yeah, the majority stage of its business life cycle. And when it needs to reinvest less of its profits and starts distributing profits back to shareholders. So if we take another look at the NYU Stern School of Business data set, we can see that if we take the entire US stock market, around one third of yeah, businesses cross profits end up being operating income. As of January 2022, the average cross margin was 34% and the average operating margin was 13%. So let's consider a fictional company. Let's pretend it manufactures and sells healthcare products and is called Helpful Hearts. Last year, this company generated revenues of $200 and posted a cross profit of $100. However, the business is still reinvesting heavily to increase brand awareness and on a net income basis, Helpful Heart is actually still a loss-making business. So in a way, the business's true earnings potential is still hidden, still invisible. However, the business is still growing rapidly. And as an investor, I will assume that it can grow its gross profits 15% annually over the next five years. This means that gross profits in five years will be around $200. If we now assume that at maturity, one third of gross profit can be turned into operating income, Helpful Hearts will generate operating profits of $67 in five years. If we now assume a conservative EBIT, so operating income, EBIT market multiple of 15, then in five years time, Helpful Hearts market capitalization will be around $1,000. US dollars. Now, depending on the rate of return that you want to achieve, you can now figure out which price you could pay for that business in order to generate that rate of return. And I think a general rule of thumb or a general rule that you should be aware of is that as the price you have to pay for any asset, as the price goes up, your future expected returns will actually go down. So for example, if you would pay $650 for the business today, you would end up with a rate of return of 9% if all of your assumptions are actually correct. If you'd only be willing to pay 500 US dollars, you would actually generate a return of 15%. And here's a little shortcut for you. According to the rule of 72, if you demand a return of 15%, you basically double your money over a five year period. So you don't even need a calculator if yeah, you demand a return of 15%. You basically simply divide the future market capitalization by two and then you can figure out yeah, the price that you can pay for the business today to achieve that 15% um, compounded annual return. 
Now, I've got a little exercise for you here. Let's consider a real company. Personally, I'm a big fan of the oat milk produced by the Swedish um, oat milk company Oatly. The company actually IPO'd just last year in 2021. But ever since then, um, the stock basically got yeah, crushed and is down some 80-82% from its peak. The business is actually still loss making, but generated cross profits of 156 million US dollars last year. Now I want you to do some valuation work here. Please let me know in the comments down below what kind of price you would be willing to pay for the entire business depending on your growth assumptions and of course your future multiple assumption assuming you would demand a rate of return of 15%. Now lastly I want to highlight that the approach that I presented in this video actually has some drawbacks too. Of course we are generalizing by using the rule of thumb that around one third of gross profits will be turned into operating profit once businesses reach maturity. Of course the real world is often a little more complex and identifying or deciphering the margin structure of individual businesses once these businesses reach maturity requires a little more effort depending on the industry and of course also the individual strength of the business. A higher or lower percentage of gross profits will be turned into operating profit. So here's what you could do. First of all you can look at the NYU data set again and consider what the average margin structure of that particular industry looks like. If we consider home builders for instance you can see that the gross profit margin is already comparatively low but that around two-thirds of cross profits are actually turned into operating profit. Moreover, you could consider the margin structure of more mature businesses with similar business models. Investors interested in Twitter's stock for example, a business that is still loss making on a net income basis. Investors could consider other profitable social media companies like Facebook. And lastly, I recommend listening to conference calls to look for hints that management gives regarding anticipated future margins. This is actually something that I discuss in this video right here in which I outline exactly that and give some additional clues. So if you want to expand your valuation toolkit and want to become a better investor, I highly recommend watching this video. Take care.